Hello folks, Dan here. I heard a lot of you all are stuck inside for some reason or other. I'm not sure why. There might be something going on that is keeping everybody indoors, so I thought I might do something to help alleviate the inevitable boredom. So tonight I'm going to try something completely different, and if it works out, maybe I'll make this a regular thing. We'll see how it goes. So tonight what I'm going to do is read from the Collier Jr. Classics, 1955 edition, volume 3, Myths and Legends, section 1, Stories from the Myths of Greece and Rome. Now mind you, these stories were intended to be read by kids uh, from age 6 to 16. And in my opinion, it's more important than ever that our kids are aware of the stories that uh, shape Western canon. Uh, in their truest forms. So with all that in mind, I will now read from this section the story of Prometheus, the aid to Zeus who brought fire to mankind. And now, Prometheus the Firebringer by W. M. L. Hutchison. In the beginning of the reign of Zeus, his bosom friend and counselor was Prometheus, by whose wisdom he had balked the titans of their revenge. But ere long the young king of the sky became jealous of that very wisdom to which he owed so much, and fell to doubting the loyalty of his chief helper. He began to say to himself that, as Prometheus had forsaken Kronos in his hour of need, so he would forsake Zeus, should he foresee the coming of some yet mightier god. Had he not, moreover, interceded for Kronos, and given him a sure refuge in those happy isles that lay beyond the range of lightning flash or thunderstorm? And was he not perhaps already conspiring with the exiled Titan to restore their ancient king? Now, what mainly bred suspicion in the mind of Zeus was this. Prometheus, though he came duly to counsel and to feast in the heavenly halls, seemed ever impatient to be gone upon some business of his own in the world below. It fell on a day that Zeus sat banqueting, throned in splendor such as mortal eye hath not seen, and surrounded by the glorious company of the Olympians, his brothers and sisters, that Prometheus rose up from his place and made to depart after his want. And Zeus asked of him, What is it you will find on earth, Prometheus, fairer than this house of mine? that you are in such haste to leave. Nothing fairer nor so fair, answered Prometheus, with a smile, but something sweeter to me. For bethink you, king of us all, that you were born where now you reign. But I am no native of the sky. To me, a son of earth, the green glens of Arcadia, are dearer than all of your starry pomp. And so he went his way, but Zeus sat frowning in his place, for the answer misliked him. Presently, he called to him the blithe-faced Hermes, his herald and messenger, and bade him follow Prometheus, and watch what he did in those glens that he loved better than the golden houses of heaven. It is for no good end, he said wrathfully, that the titan hides his doings from my view under the dense covert of his oak woods. Straightway Hermes put on his shining winged sandals that bear him over sea and land more swiftly than bird can fly and sped upon his errand. When he came again, Zeus asked him what he had seen. King of gods, said Hermes, smiling, have no fear that Prometheus will plot anything against us Olympians. He wrecks not of us. All his delight is in the race of puny mortals whom he made out of the clay to pleasure old Kronos, and for his business in Arcadia, it is neither more nor less than devising their welfare. He has taught them, it seems, to fashion rude tools and weapons of horn and bone and flint, to build themselves huts, to till and sow the ground, and many other arts that the men of the gold and silver ages knew nothing of. I heard some among them speak of him. They call him the great brother whose wisdom helps to lighten their hard lot. And there was word also of a wondrous gift he has promised to bestow upon them ere long. What? gift is that? asked Zeus uneasily. 
They do not know, answered Hermes, but Prometheus has told them that it will be to them a good servant and a bad master. Now Zeus was troubled at these tidings, for he did not believe that the great Titan would thus befriend mere mortals, creatures of a day, without some deep design. In time, perhaps, he would teach them so much that they would become wiser than the gods. Nay, this unknown gift he had promised them might be some potent charm that would make them strong enough to defy the Lord of Thunder. Zeus pondered long what this gift might be, but he could make no guess at it. So, when the immortals were again gathered to the banquet, he put forth a riddle to them all, saying, What is it that is a good servant and a bad master? Some said one thing, some another. But Prometheus knew that Hermes had spied upon him in Arcadia, and whispered in his ear, Minion of Zeus, if you would win favor with your master, say, It is fire. And Hermes said it laughing after his wont, for he himself never bore ill will to anyone, and dreamed not that a quarrel was toward between his lord and the titan. Zeus no sooner heard the answer of Hermes than he perceived that fire was indeed the gift Prometheus was minded to bestow upon men, which, as yet, was unknown to mortals, and burned only beneath the earth and on the sacred hearth of the gods on high. He resolved to defeat the purpose of Prometheus, whatever it might be, and rising up, he said, You have heard, Olympians, my riddle and its answer. Now hear and obey my command. Let none dare to profane the thrice holy element of fire by bestowing it on mortals, but be it forever consecrate to use of the gods alone. Swift vengeance will I take upon him who shall transgress this my law. The rest of the immortals hastily promised obedience, but Prometheus began to plead earnestly with Zeus for the race of mortals, but bidding him remember the want and hardship they must endure now that earth no longer gave her increase freely as in the age of gold. Without fire, he said, mankind could not warm their shivering frames in the winter season nor forge weapons of metal to defend themselves from beasts of prey, nor bring to perfection any of those helpful crafts that he had begun to teach them. Forbid them fire, he cried, and you forbid them all hope of rising above the life of animals. Their doom is sure. They must be savages to the end. But Zeus would not hearken to his pleading, for he could not see that the heart of Prometheus was filled with compassion and loving kindness for helpless man, being indeed blinded by his jealous mistrust. What are this folk of clay to me? He said disdainfully. They were not made for my pleasure, that I would show them favor. Nay, they belong to Kronos, who bade you provide him new worshippers when he had destroyed the face of silver. For his sake they are hateful to me, and I have a mind to cut them off as he did those others. And people earth with a race that has known no other gods but me. Prometheus made him no answer, but gave him a look at once proud and mournful, and in a little while he departed without word of farewell. And after that he came no more to the board of Zeus. But when some days had passed, Zeus looked forth upon the earth and saw pillars of blue smoke rising among the trees in all the valleys of Arcadia. For Prometheus had taken fire from the hearth of the gods by stealth and brought it to men in a hollow wand of fennel that served him instead of a staff. He had shown them how to make open hearths of sun-baked clay in their poor dwellings and how to kindle dry wood thereon with the new gift. And they cried aloud for joy and wonder as they saw the scarlet flowers of flame blossom from the dead boughs. Then was Zeus wroth indeed, and the first moment of his fury he stretched forth his hand to his thunderbolts with intent to hurl them upon the land of Arcadia, and utterly consume every living thing therein. But he bethought them suddenly of a better way to wreak vengeance upon the rebel Prometheus, and he stayed his hand. Thunderbolts could not slay the titan, since he was immortal, and to destroy the land and the men he loved would but be a small satisfaction for he could soon make himself another folk in some country fairer than Arcadia. 
These men shall not die, said the angry god, but I will devise such evils for them that they shall desire death rather than life, and Prometheus shall see their misery and be powerless to succor them. That shall be his keenest pang among the torments I will heap upon him. Now there are giant twins whose lot it is to serve him that sit upon the throne of heaven, be he who he may, and the gods call them Kratos and Bia, that is to say might and force. These Zeus called before him, and having laid certain commands on them, he sent them to the forge of the Cyclops in Mount Etna, which he had given to the lame smith god Hephaestus, the cunning craftsman of the Olympians, to be his workshop. Meanwhile Prometheus, not ignorant of his doom, betook himself to the house of his brother, Prometheus, and said to him, Brother, I am bound on a far journey, and must bid farewell to you and to Acadia, our pleasant home. For the fates will have it so. Grieve not, nor be amazed at the things you will shortly hear concerning me, since all that must befall me I have foreseen with unshaken mind. But take good heed to yourself, and beware above all else of receiving of receiving any gift from Zeus. With that he took leave of his brother, and returned to his own house, to await those whom he knew would come speedily. And that night he went unresisting with Kratos, Bia, and Hephaestus, to his place of punishment. There is a ravine of ice-clad rocks upon the peak of huge Mount Couscous, so walled about with giant black precipices, so ghastly in its frozen desolation, that it might seem a very temple of death, where nothing living had ever come since the making of the world. Not the tiniest, lowliest plant that grows peeps from the crannies of its jagged cliffs. No voice of beast or bird ever echoes there, save the scream of a famished eagle far aloft. Yet it is a solitude without peace, for night and day fierce gusts sweep through the gorge, now wailing like spirits in torment now with uproar so hideous that to hear it would drive a man from his wits. The bright snow that lies deep upon the mountain head is whirled away by those pitiless blasts before it can mantle the unsightly masses of rock that bestrew the floor of the ravine or the lightning-scarred crags whence they have fallen. Hither now came the captive titan Prometheus, led by the ministers of Zeus. They had bound him with fetters of brass and with chains of iron, which Hephaestus had wrought, being so commanded, but sorely against his will. For he and all the Olympians loved Prometheus because of his great and gracious ways, and, had they dared, would have interceded for him with their king. But Kratos and Bia, who were by nature without pity, exalted over their mighty prisoner, and when they now come to the place Zeus had appointed and saw that Hephaestus stood, Gazing sorrow sorrowfully upon him, they were enraged. Hephaestus, cried Kratos fiercely, why loiter you now? Have you a mind to take sides with this fire-stealer, or have you so soon forgot the charge Zeus gave you by my mouth? I would he had given it to some other, muttered the lame god Hephaestus. Have a care, Haltfoot, that he overhear you not, answered Kratos tauntingly. It is well seen that you are loath to do his bidding, and if you make not better speed, your pity may be sh shortly be needed for your own plight. Savage that you are, retorted Hephaestus, what needs your rude urging? I know and will perform the sentence of Zeus, but none that has not like you a heart of stone could joy in such a task. Come, let us about it, and hold your peace the while. Forthwith, Kratos and Bia caused Prometheus to stand upright against a huge pillar of rock, and they held up his arms above his head while Hephaestus bound him to the pillar by the neck and wrists and ankles, riveting his fetters to the rock with nails of adamant. Slowly he plied his hammer, slowly he limped to and fro, and as he worked and heavily sighed. Meanwhile, Kratos fested his eyes on the sight and exclaimed impatiently against his slackness. Bind him faster, Hephaestus, he cried. Drive home this spike through the iron collar that he may not turn his head to the right or left. Look you how loose it sits on this manacle. Another rivet, I pray you, lest the cunning rebel shake himself free. So, have you done at last? Aha! Prometheus, could not all your foresight save you from this pass? 
now learn too late what it is to be the friend of man and the foe of Zeus. Never a word, answered Prometheus, but Hephaestus angrily bade Kratos and Via be gone, for they have done their office. As they sullenly withdrew, he turned to the motionless figure against the pillar and spoke parting words. Son of Earth, he said, not more unwelcome are those bonds to you who wear them than was the forging of them to me. Alas, that my skill is put to such a proof that I must bind one of race divine in these shackles which no power can break. Ah, rash Prometheus, why did you flout the majesty of Zeus for the sake of worthless mortals? Know ye not that a newcomer makes ever a stern master jealous of his honor? Loath I am to leave you thus, but I can avail you nothing, nor see I whence you are to look for any deliverer. Here, then, you must hide. Shut out from sight and speech of gods or men by these eternal walls. Here, unsheltered in the scorching blaze of noon, you will pray for the coming of starry, starry night. Albeit, to you she brings no solace, but only exchange of torment, the arrows of frost for the arrows of the sun. I, where naught else ever changes, dear to your sleepless eyes, shall be the comings of morn and eve. Having thus spoken, Hephaestus also went his way with a halting step, and all was silence for a space in that prison house. Then a great cry broke from the titan in his anguish. O oh, earth, mother of all, O oh, radiant sky and free winds of heaven, behold what wrongs are mine. Yea, I call upon the sun's pure splendor and the multitudinous smile of ocean waves, and you, O oh, founts of the rivers, to witness what an outrage of, a, of an immortal suffers at an immortal's hand. Behold these shameful bonds, this living tomb where I must wrestle alone with never-ending pain. To this, the new lord of the world has doomed Prometheus for no other crime than giving man fire from heaven. He paused a while, communing with his own heart, then said, Yet why do I lament? All this I foresaw from the beginning, and knew at how great a price I must win for mankind the thrice-blessed gift of fire, whereby alone they shall attain to mastery in every art that ministers to life. Nor will I upbraid the tyrant who has thus repaid my ancient kindness. Not he, but restless fate, has decreed my doom, and he also in the hour ordained must learn to submit, as I do. Now while the captive titan comforted his heart with the thought of what mankind would be able to accomplish by the means of fire, Zeus sat pondering how he might frustrate that good gift with some countervailing evil. For it is a law to all the immortals that none may take away what another has bestowed, nor could he even now deprive mortals of their new possession. He purposed, therefore, to send them some gift so baneful that they should never be free from misery their lives long and thus fill up the measure of his vengeance upon Prometheus. After a long thought, he called Hephaestus to him and said, Hephaestus, I have devised a new thing that has not its like in earth or heaven. Now put forth all your skill, for you must forthwith make it according to the fashion I will tell you. Of what shall I make it? asked Hephaestus. Of whatever you can find most fair, said Zeus, Mingle together all things loveliest, sweetest, and best, but look that you also mingle therewith the opposites of each. So Hephaestus took gold and dross, wax and flint, pure snow and mud of the highways, honey and gall. He took the bloom of the rose and the toad's venom, the voice of laughing water and the peacock's squall. He took the sea's beauty and its treachery, the dog's fidelity, the wind's inconsistency, the cruelty of the tiger and the mother bird's heart of love. All these and other contraries past number he blended cunningly into one substance and thus he molded into the shape that Zeus described to him. When it was finished, Hephaestus looked upon his handiwork and said, We have made no new thing but the image of a goddess. Nay, said Zeus, we have made the first woman. And with that, he breathed upon the image, and it lived, and it looked upon them wonderingly, as one suddenly awakened. Then he called all the Olympians to behold the first woman, and they marveled at the beauty of her, 
for in truth she was fair as any goddess. They cried they would offer her some gift on this her birthday, and so they did. The goddesses arrayed her in glorious apparel. Hephaestus decked her with jewels of cunning worksmanship, and every god gave her some precious thing. Last of all, Zeus himself placed in her hands a casket of lustrous amber, richly overwrought with flowers and fruit of the pomegranate, and having two golden snakes for handles. Behold, immortals, he said, this new fair creature of my shaping thought, endowed with every earthly loveliness, laden with heaven's choicest treasures, sh shall she not be named Pandora, all gifted? Seems she not even as a bride adorned for her husband? But she is no mate for an Olympian, for she is mortal. Come, let us send her to wed with Ep Epimetheus, in token that we may bear him no ill will for his rebel brother's sake. The Olympians were well pleased, for they knew not the guileful intent of Zeus, and straightway he bade Hermes lead Pandora into the house of Epimetheus and say to him, The king of gods, in sign of his goodwill toward you, sends you this peerless bride, who brings with her in this casket such a dowry as he only can bestow. So Hermes brought the first woman to Arcadia. Now when Epimetheus saw her beauty and heard why she was come, he could scarce contain himself for joy at his good fortune, and he received the bride with her casket into his house and wedded her that day, without once remembering the warning Prometheus gave him not to take any gift from Zeus. But on the morrow it came back to his mind, and he repented of what he had done, for this was his nature, that he was never wise until it was too late. From this he had his name of Epimetheus, which means afterthought even as his brother was called Prometheus, or Forethought, because he was as wise about things to come. Epimetheus now reflected that dowry Zeus had given his bride was doubtless meant to work him some deadly harm, and he asked Pandora if she knew what lay in her amber box. No, my husband, said she, but I will, fix, I will fetch the box from our chamber, and we will open it and see. I long to know what the great king of immortals has bestowed upon us. Bide here, Pandora, said the titan, and listen well to what I shall say. My mind misgives me that yonder casket holds some evil secret, and he who sent it is not a friend, but a subtle enemy. I was warned erewhile to take no gift at his hand, but in my folly I paid little heed. Now since what is done cannot be undone, and the gift is under my roof, here let it stay, but I charge you on your love and obedience, never open the casket. Whatever it holds can do us no mischief while we keep it fast shut, and it is itself so royal rich and beautiful a thing that I have no heart to cast it away. Pandora was glad that she might keep the wondrous box, and every day she viewed it with delight as it shone like a translucent gold in the sunlight. But after a while she wearied of that pleasure and began to wonder more and more what might be hidden within it. Many a time, alone in her chamber, she sat gazing at the casket until longing to learn its secret so nearly overcame her that she arose and went hastily forth, vowing to look on it no more. At last, in an accursed hour, she could not resist her desire any longer. She laid her hand upon the lid and raised it gently, very gently half fearful of what she might see. Quick as thought out flew a swarm of tiny winged sprites, soaring and drifting upward like breeze-blown tufts of thistle down, and they vanished like a wreath of smoke through the open doorway. With a startled cry, Pandora closed the box, but alas, too late. One glance had shown her it was empty, and she sat down and wept tears of disappointment. Now she had known what she had done. She must have grieved a thousand times more bitterly for the sprites she had let loose were all the cares and woes and fell diseases that afflict mankind. And from that hour to this they fly abroad upon earth, pursuing hapless mortals from the cradle to the grave. Such was the dower that the first woman brought up with her into the world. Epimetheus found his wife weeping, and she told them what had befallen, and he forgave her and said, Half the fault is mine, because I left the casket in your keeping. It seems that it is as much a woman's nature to be over-curious as it is mine to be wise too late. And he forbade to reproach her, although he now knew well enough by the power of afterthought what those sprites were. 
He asked Pandora if she was sure they had all escaped, and she said, yes. But by and by she thought she would look again, and when she opened the casket she saw that there was one still left, clinging beneath the gold rim that held up the lid, with its rainbow wings drooping as if broken. And something told Pandora that its name was Hope. Thank you for listening to this reading of Prometheus the Firebringer by W. M. L. Hutchison from the Collier Junior Classics 1955 edition, Volume 3. Stay safe and healthy out there, folks. Until next time.